Hey there, it's Corey with Ascend Smarter Intervention, where we make research-based reading intervention easy. And today I wanted to talk about a little something different. So we wanted to talk about what students really need in order to be successful in the classroom. Now, we talk a lot about reading because we know that reading is an essential skill to be successful in the classroom. But what we also know is that that's not all we need to be successful in the classroom. There are some other key skills that we need to be incorporating as well. So if you follow us, you know that we really do believe in the simple view of reading, if you will. So what the simple view of reading states is that if a student can decode, they can sound words out, and they have appropriate listening comprehension abilities or language skills, then they're gonna be able to comprehend what they're reading. Now, what we know is that many students are gonna need explicit instruction in both areas. So they're gonna need explicit instruction in decoding, which we talk all about all the time, but they're also gonna need instruction in developing comprehension skills. But here's the thing, one of the most important things we need to recognize is that we have a limited amount of time with our students and they have a limited capacity for all of the different strategies and skills and everything that we're trying to teach. So when we can create a framework that's going to allow us to hit multiple targets, just teaching one strategy, that's going to be huge. So what we know is that if decoding plus listening comprehension is going to give us reading comprehension, we can start to think about what are those listening comprehension skills that students need to have when they're listening to information, recognizing that a lot of what we do in class is we sit and listen to our teacher talk. We listen to a lecture. We need to be able to draw important information out. Then we spend a good amount of our time as we get older, reading and trying to draw meaning from reading. What we also recognize is that we have a triangulation here that we don't want to leave out. This whole idea of this also impacts our writing. We talk a lot about reading and writing as reciprocal processes, right? It's just basically two sides to the same coin. What we need to consider when we think about written composition, so when you're writing something, you're writing something for somebody else to either be able to read and comprehend or for somebody to listen to that information and comprehend it. So we've got this triangulation here, if you will, or sort of this relationship in which listening comprehension is related to reading comprehension. And both of those are also related to written composition. Can we write something that somebody else can comprehend either through listening or through reading? What we need to think about is how do we develop those skills for listening comprehension and how can we pull it together in an easy way for students to be able to really default and use these strategies when they're in the classroom, when they're reading their text. So there's a couple of things that we want to talk about. Now, obviously there are so many comprehension strategies. So I wanna be clear, we're not trying to oversimplify. We're not trying to leave out some of the other skills that we definitely need to have to be able to fully comprehend. However, if we can start here, if we can start with this basic framework, we can start to think about how our other comprehension skills really pull into this. And that's ultimately what we need to do to be able to get students to that end goal of comprehension. So first things first, we have to activate background knowledge. So background knowledge is everything that we know about a topic. If you've read the blog, I mentioned a story that I was in college and I was sitting in my chemistry class and before I knew it, I was completely lost. I had no idea what was going on. They were talking about things that I had never heard of before. And then I realized, oh my gosh, I'm sitting in the wrong class. I'm not in chemistry. I am in a calculus for engineers class. Okay, I'm in the same, same building at the school. And I was just an hour early for my class, but I had no background knowledge. And because I had no background knowledge, 
they may as well have been speaking another language because even though I understood the words, right, I could have read the words that they were saying, I had no background knowledge and so couldn't tie that information to anything meaningful. And that's one of the most important things that we need to recognize is that we're more apt to comprehend information that we can tie some background or previous knowledge to. So we need to be clear that we're giving students an opportunity to activate background knowledge. Then we need to make sure that we're giving students the opportunity to identify the purpose and the main idea. So part of the reason I was struggling in this class was that the purpose that I thought that I was supposed to be learning about wasn't connecting at all. So we need to be able to recognize what is this text about? What is the take home message that I should be gaining from this? Is this a narrative where, you know, the author is entertaining or trying to teach a moral or a lesson? And not even just author, I want to be really careful here because thinking back to what I talked about with the triangulation, this can also be the speaker. What is the speaker trying to help me understand right now? And essentially what we need to do to be able to, to gain that is one, we need to have some clarity from the outset of what is the purpose? What am I trying to draw? Again, is it a narrative? Is it informative? Is it an opinion? Am I listening to an ad? Right, because we need to be able to think about how we're going to analyze that information and knowing the author's purpose or the information's purpose is really, really important. If I'm listening to something on the radio and I recognize it's an advertisement, I need to be drawing potentially some different conclusions than if I'm listening to an informative piece. One of the best ways to really understand what the main idea is, is to actually move down a level into identifying key details. So when we're thinking about identifying key details in a text, we often use the five W's strategy. Now, that doesn't mean that this is going to fully encapsulate or incorporate every single key detail that may be in a text. However, it definitely gives us a framework. So essentially, we're going to put up our five fingers. I'm going to ask who, what, when, where, why in this text. And if I can get through that who, what, when, where, why, that's really going to help me to be able to think about that text in more detail to be able to make sure that I'm drawing some of those important conclusions out of that. Now, in our practice, we like to have students highlight those key details, anything that's gonna kind of hit those five W's in a specific color in their text, or they're writing this in their notebook. They're putting kind of those five W's and they are writing those in a specific color or in a specific place in their notes. Then what we do is we work backwards to figure out, okay, what are those five W's all tying back to, to help further solidify what the main idea is. From there, we can start to compare and contrast. We can start to categorize information at an even deeper level. And we'll get into an example here in just a second about what that looks like. But essentially this is taking the information out of the context of just that piece of information or that piece of text on its own and starting to draw in other things that we have learned about or that we understand so that we can say, does this information fit or does it not fit? And then finally, we can jump into conclusions, inferences, and predictions. So as soon as we can take the information that we gained from the text, really that kind of main idea, those key details, then we can add it to that previous sort of background knowledge and comparing and contrasting with what we already know, that's going to allow us to create conclusions. And then from there, we can start to make inferences. What does this mean? And what can I predict in the future? So quick examples. We can go back to kind of that idea of the key details. We've got our main idea. We've got those key details. Again, who, what, when, where, why. If they don't all fit perfectly into that framework, that's okay. But again, it's gonna give us a starting point. Then when we start to look at comparing and contrasting, okay, I'm, for example, learning about the British empire and their rule over time. And one of the things that I've learned is that some of the territories that they controlled ultimately ended up wanting autonomy. They wanted to control their own territory, their own colony. So I could start to think about, all right, if I know that the main players, the who here was Canada, Australia, 
United States, India, South Africa, just to name a few. Obviously, there's way more players than that. But just in this instance, that's my who. This is kind of what they were doing. This is how I'm categorizing that information and bucketing it for my brain. Then I can even take that a step deeper to be able to say, okay, well, if we know that, for example, the United States, South Africa, and India all had to fight for their independence, how did that fighting occur? Are there similarities? Are there differences here? What did that look like? Then we can start to think about who were the leaders? When did this happen? Why did this happen? And that's how we can start to compartmentalize that information so that we can start asking questions and wondering about how other information starts to connect. This is critical because this is what allows us to essentially be able to use our brain as a mental filing cabinet. And when we're doing this, we're filing those files in the appropriate place. If we're not filing information appropriately, we don't have it available for later recall either because it kind of went in one year and out the other, it never really made it into the filing cabinet, or it's in the filing cabinet, but it's not stored in a way that's effective and efficient. And so I can't pull it out when I need it for a test or just for later when I need to have this information as part of who I am in society. Now, the last piece here, as I mentioned, is that we're really taking that information that we learned from either the text or from listening to the information. We're adding that to the information that we already know, and we're using that to create inferences. And from there, those inferences can allow us to create predictions and take that really to the next step. So again, key importance here is that we have to teach comprehension skills. We have to teach them explicitly, but one of the most important things we can do, I'm just going to flip back real quick here, is to create that triangulation between when we're listening to information. Let's use that same framework when we're reading information. We're going to use that same framework when we're writing information for somebody else. We're going to use that same framework. We want to help people to be able to get through their comprehension process as easily as possible. So. We're going to be talking more about specifically what that looks like. We love using graphic organizers to help students to organize this information, but we wanted to start here because it's critical that we see the connection between these three things so we can understand that when we teach these frameworks or this one framework, you can use it in these three different ways, which is amazing. It's going to help your students exponentially. That's all we got on this. If you have any questions, let us know in the comments and we'll look forward to hearing your thoughts.